18 through 21, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Good morning. The place is pretty full today. We're grateful for the presence of each and every one, and certainly the presence of our visitors. We, have, we always have a lot of visitors, but today we have an extra lot of visitors. <laughs> But we want you to know we are so grateful you're here. We're grateful you've chosen to come and be with us. We hope that you'll come back and see us anytime you have opportunity. I will say this. I was talking to a young person this morning who came through the door, and she asked me about Bible classes, and I said, Honey, we'll have them tonight. Well, I was wrong, young lady. I'm so sorry. This is the first Sunday of the month, and so we have two sermons on Sunday. We do things a little bit differently here at Fishers than most churches. Uh, most of the time we do have our Bible classes on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, but this Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, we always have two worship services. But I will also add this for good measure, starting this Wednesday and going through Friday, we're starting our VBS, our Vacation Bible Study. Uh, and that's especially geared to young people. It's for everybody, but especially geared to young people. So uh, please come, if you're able, come back for that and join us with the, for those studies. But thank you so much for coming. And uh, get, hang around after a while, get to, after services, get to know us, visit with us. And uh, uh, I'm sure you'll find a friendly group of disciples. And as I've said from time to time, if somebody here doesn't treat you right, let me know. And I know what I'll be preaching about next week. So, <laughs> all right. Romans chapter 1. We want... We, been looking at the news, of course, and uh, the news seems like it's always bad, doesn't it? And if you look, read Romans chapter 1, I didn't have Jay read the whole thing. We could have read the whole thing all the way down to the end of the chapter. But if you read through that, it almost sounds like it, was, it came off the front page of the newspaper, doesn't it? Now, I say that nowadays most newspapers are virtual. If you go online and you read your newspapers now, it used to be they were delivered to your homes, uh, pay, actual paper paper. Uh, but very few of those are made anymore. But still, you have the idea of newspapers bringing the news. And when you read through the news, a lot of times it sounds just like Romans 1. Or perhaps I could reverse that. When you read Romans 1, it sounds like a lot of front page news. It sounds like modern society. It reminds me of something, uh, an old brother, old Don Fisher. John knows Don Fisher from Stilesville. Don Fisher used to always say, God never changes and man never changes. And boy, isn't that true. The world uh, is full of wickedness. And here in the last month or so, there have been several, I mean several, shootings here and there. And it reminds us of the moral and spiritual failure of the United States of America. Now, and we're not alone in that, by the way. These things are scattered throughout the world, but we certainly have to look at ourselves this morning when we think of this. And tragedies, uh, to, to put this in perspective and to help us to think real about this, tragedies have always occurred in this world. We sometimes just think about the tragedies that occur recently, but tragedies have always occurred. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke 13. Uh, and by the way, hold your place in Romans 1. We're going, to, we're going to camp out in Romans 1 this morning. But in Luke 13, we read about a, a tragedy that took place in the days of Jesus. So this is 2,000 years ago. In just the very first verse, it says, There were present at that season some who told him, the him there being Jesus, who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So this was a tragedy. The, the governor of Pilate, the governor of Judea, he mingled the blood of the Galileans with their sacrifices. This was a massacre, is basically what this was, and it was a government-sponsored massacre. And so sometimes we think government is our friend. Government is not always our friend. Let's be wise to this. And here we have the idea of Pilate, the governor, massacring a number of people. It was a tragedy that occurred. And while we're on that subject, we might go back to the Old Testament, the book of Exodus. The very last verse in the, in the first chapter of Exodus reminds us that Pharaoh had issued a command that all male children be thrown into the river. Now you think about that. You think of every male child that is born has to be thrown into the river. 
And so there was a goodly number of babies who were drowned in that day and time. And again, a government-sponsored type of thing. And then you fast forward to Jesus' day when he was born. King Herod commanded that all the male children from two years old and under in Bethlehem and all the surrounding districts be put to death. Think of that. Tragedies. Tragedies. Some of them random and some of them government-sponsored. But at any rate, the point I'm making here is tragedies have always occurred. And it brings up a question, doesn't it? What in the world is wrong with this world? And, you know, it's easy to give the answer, a one-word answer, sin, isn't it? That's what it is. Let's just be plain about it. That's what's wrong with the problem. And by the way, and I don't, I'm not trying to be political here. I'm just trying to be practical. I want you to think about it. The problem is not guns, people. It's the people wielding the guns. That's the problem. It's the people wielding the guns. And so we have to understand, my friends, that what's wrong with this world is not things like guns. What's wrong with this world is the people who live in it, the sin that they indulge in, the sin that they live in. That's the problem. And the real problem of sin is that it's progressive, isn't it? Sin is a progressive thing. You start out little, you start out small, one little thing, one little infraction, one little transgression, and then it becomes two, and then it becomes four, and then it becomes eight, and then it becomes 16, and it just multiplies. And, and soon it's all around us, and it's everywhere. And so sin is a progressive thing. That's why you hear people like me stand up here and, and preach so hard against sin, because it's not a little thing, it's not a minor thing, and the more that we tolerate and the more that we put up with, the worse that it gets. Mark it down. You've seen it. You don't have to take my word for it. You've seen it in your lifetime. And so I wanted to use Romans 1 as sort of a template. We're going to be studying in Romans 1, and it'll be a template of showing this progressive nature of sin because it will, it will show us exactly what's wrong with this world besides just saying the word sin. It will develop it very uh, explicitly and very specifically. And at the end of the sermon, I want to bring it around to a more positive note to let us to know that there is good news out there, that there is a way to change things. And that's where you and I come in. When we think about changing the world, how are we going to do that? We, it's our job to do it, by the way. If we don't do it, nobody will. If God's people, if Christians, if the children of God don't reach out and try to change the world, nobody else will. We won't get it done, and we certainly won't get it done God's way. So let's think about this this morning. Stay in Romans 1 with me, and let's notice the first thing that jumps out in the text is that people begin to reject obvious evidence for God. Read with me verses 18, 19, and 20. He's reminding us in verse 18 that God is angry for the wrath of God. Another word for wrath is anger. God is angry about sin. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. If you write in your Bible, circle the word all. God's not angry just about the big sins. God's angry about all sin, all unrighteousness, and all ungodliness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Notice right away that there's an there's a, there's a activity going on to suppress the truth. We don't want to hear the truth. No, we want to hear something else. We want to hear something that appeals to us. So there are people out there who suppress the truth. And look at what he says in verse 19. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. What do you mean, Paul? For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I've said many times as I've read those verses over the years, there is no excuse for atheism. There isn't. And this verse says as much. It says that. He's saying, you just look at the creation. Look at the precision of the creation, how it, how it, how it works, how it functions. And you could look at the, the heavenly bodies out there. You know, the earth rotates on its axis 24 hours, every 24 hours. The moon rotates around the earth every 28 days. The, the earth goes around the sun every 365 and one quarter day. Don't forget about that one quarter day because every four years we tack an extra day onto the calendar, don't we? To, to make up for that. that, that four years and four quarters of a day makes another day, you see. So we have leap year. But all of that functions with clock-like precision. And it amazes me that someone says, well, that just happened by accident. It's just a big explosion. Boom! And look at all the precision. Nonsense. I don't have that kind of faith. Look at the human body. What a marvel of design the human body is. You could look at the body as a whole or you could look at various parts of the body. Think about the eye for just a second. 
how that I can look right here and I can see Al's handsome face and Kathy's pretty face and, and, I, and I can just in an instant go back there and see Jeff Martin's ugly face back there. <laughs> but just like that, without having to, now if you had a camera, you'd have to focus, wouldn't you? Is it here? And then you'd have to, and you'd have to refocus. But no, you see, the human eye does it instantaneously. Oh, that's just an accident. Just an accident by an explosion that occurred millions of years ago. I don't have that kind of faith, people. I can't believe such nonsense as that. The evidence is all around us. Look at the thing. And people say, nah, there's no God. There's no God. My friends, wake up and open your eyes. And, and the ultimate evidence for our faith, and I, I've believed this for years, the ultimate evidence for our faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is a historical fact. Did you know that? The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical fact attested to by a number of witnesses who were there, who saw him die on that cross, who saw him rise from the grave. A number of witnesses have left their testimony behind. That's what you have in your New Testament. The witnesses, the testimony of the witnesses. And, and, and so we have all of this evidence staring at us, screaming at us. Yes, there's a God and you better pay attention to him. No. Nah. There's no God, and that's the first step off the precipice, isn't it? Turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. And Peter, in, in the book of 2 Peter, he tells us he's about ready to die. It's not going to be too long that they're going to take him away and crucify him. Secular history tells us that the Apostle Peter was actually crucified upside down. He said he wasn't worthy to be crucified like his Lord, and so he insisted that they crucify him upside down. But Peter's talking about that in, in 2 Peter. And he makes mention of the fact that he's about ready to die. We might look here just very quickly here in verse 14, chapter 1 and verse 14. Peter says, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ says, show me. Put off his tent, it's his body. He's going to die. He's fixing to die, you see. But then we get down here to verse 16. And he's reminding these brethren, because he's about ready to die, and he's leaving behind a written record. That's what we're looking at here. We're looking at their written record they've left behind. And he says in verse 16, We did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw Jesus. We ate with Jesus. We heard Jesus. We watched him die, and we watched him be raised from the dead. We are eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then he refers to one specific event, the transfiguration, verse 17. He received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Imagine what that must have been like to be on that mount of transfiguration, to see Jesus transfigured, to see Moses and Elijah appear, and to hear the voice of God from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. Verse 18, And we heard this voice. Not only were they eyewitnesses, but I'm going to make up a word here. They were ear witnesses. <laughs> They, were, they heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so, verse 19, we have the prophetic word confirmed. The prophetic word, he's referring to the Old Testament. You see, the Old Testament had foretold all these things. The Old Testament had foretold that Jesus would come, that he would die for our sins, that he would be buried, that he would be raised. The prophets foretold this, and he says, now that we've seen it, we have it confirmed. It's a fact, folks. It's a fact. We have the prophetic word confirmed, which you would do well to heed. Listen. That's what he said. Pay attention to the word. Don't reject the evidence for God. You would do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. What's wrong with this world? Well, first of all, it's a dark place. <laughs> it's a dark place. But there's a light that shines in this dark world. It's right here. This is the light. The light brought to us by Jesus Christ. A light shining in a dark place, he says. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. That's just a nice poetic way of saying until you get it and it clicks. Ah, he is the Son of God. This is real. There is a God. And he says in verse 20 and 21, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came. Keep in mind he's talking about the origin here of prophecy. Prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. But right here, when you want to start diagnosing what's wrong with this world, what in the world is wrong with this world, so, so many people are just rejecting what's right in front of their face. The obvious evidence for God. You know that Bible in your hands, or that's sitting in the pew there in front of you. People have tried to persecute it out of existence. They've tried to burn it out of existence. And it's still here. Parts of that Bible are 4,000 years old. The book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible. 
probably a 4,000 year old book. It's still here. It's not been burned out of existence. It's not been destroyed. Why? God is watching over and protecting His Word. There's evidence that people reject it. That's what's wrong with the world. Let's go back to the text. Let's notice something else. Instead of looking at the evidence for God and looking at the Bible, we're pursuing the limited wisdom of men. Oh, that guy's got a Ph.D. He's really smart. Let's pay attention to him. Let's listen to him. Let's do what he says. Now, I'm not putting down having a Ph.D. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. But we put way too much emphasis on the wisdom of men. Way too much and not nearly enough emphasis on the wisdom of God. Look here at Romans 1, starting with verse 21, reading down to verse 23. Now, remember... 18, 19, 20, they rejected the evidence for God. They're without excuse, but they did it anyway. Verse 21, because although they knew God, how they know Him? By the creation, by the things that are made. He just said that. So although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful. But they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Here it comes, here it comes. Professing to be wise, they became fools. We're the smartest people in the world. That's what every century says that, don't they? We're the smartest people in the world. And then the next century comes along and kind of outdoes them. And it just shows us that human wisdom is limited. And human knowledge is limited. And people profess to be wise. They think they have all the answers. They think they know it. But no, we become fools, you see. And we exchange the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Now, Paul's writing about a time when people engaged in idolatry. They turned away from God. They rejected the evidence for God. They pursued the wisdom of man. And in doing that, they started worshiping idols. There are other idols. We'll talk about that a little bit later. There are other idols besides stone and marble and steel. There are other idols. And we'll talk about those in a minute. But right here, I just want you to think about that. Professing to be wise, they became Fools. Man thinks he's smarter than he really is. You know, we've all had that experience with somebody, haven't we? Somebody who, who starts talking to us about something and it becomes clear about three words in that they don't have a clue what they're talking about. <laughs> and, and you just don't want to listen to them any longer. But they think they know. Oh, I know. And, and I'm just, I was trying to think of a way to illustrate that. Now, when I was a kid, I was really into the Indy 500. And some of you older people will know these names. You younger people probably won't know them. But when I was a kid, the big names, Mario Andretti, Al Unser, Bobby Unser, A.J. Foy, Johnny Rutherford, those were my heroes when I was a kid. Those were the names we looked to. Today they're long gone. They're, they're, out, of the, they're out of it. And I couldn't tell you, I don't even know who won the race this year. Uh, and so for me to stand up here and pretend as though I know something about the Indianapolis 500 as it is currently uh, done, I would make a fool of myself. That's the thing I'm trying to get you to see here. And there are people who do that when it comes to the problems of this world or when it comes to the Bible. You ever come across somebody who thinks they know the Bible? And about three words in, it's very clear they don't know beans about the Bible. Oh, they make these great, well, the Bible says this and the Bible says that. Well, where does it say that? Oh, it's in there somewhere. <laughs> well, that's not good enough. <laughs> that's not good. It's in there somewhere. It's not good enough. Show me. I'm from Missouri. Show me, you see. But there, there's nothing more pathetic than someone who thinks they're smart and they're really not. And that's what he's driving at here. We're pursuing the limited wisdom of man. And, and, and that's a mistake. Take your Bibles, turn to Proverbs chapter 9, if you will. A couple of verses here I want you to look at. We need to learn to be humble, to realize that we don't know everything. None of us do. And we need to open up our minds to the possibility that we might be wrong about this or we might be wrong about that. We need to pursue knowledge. There's nothing to be afraid of in pursuing actual knowledge and pursuing truth. There's nothing to fear there. And yet we're scared to death. We're scared to death we might have to change. We're scared to death we might have to think differently. But that's a good thing if you're thinking towards truth. If you're thinking towards God, that's a great thing. But look here in Proverbs 9, verse 9. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Why? Because he listens. He pays attention. He's not going to just pursue, well, that's not what my preacher said, or that's not what my, uh, uh, my expert over here said. No, listen, he's saying. And the wise man will be wiser precisely because he does listen. Teach a just man, and he will what? Increase learning. Increase. You learn more, you see. There's not a, it's not like, well, I've reached all there, not, there is to know. I don't need to know anything else. That's not so for any of us. So keep learning and keep growing. Verse 10, the fear of the Lord 
is the beginning of wisdom. Now here, they're pursuing the wisdom of man, which is very limited, very limited. We've talked about in other sermons about President Washington, the first president of the United States. The medical technology, the experts, the science of the day said we need to bleed him. Need to bleed George. And they bled him to death. That's how the first president died, by following the science, by following the technology of the day, and they bled him to death. How sad. How sad that is because we don't listen and we follow the limited wisdom of man. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You want to start really being wise in this world? Start listening to God and start fearing God. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Open those Bibles up, people. Stop listening to men and start listening to God. Every one of us has access to a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, let me know. We'll buy you a Bible. We can buy, you, we can buy a, a paperback Bible for a buck. They're everywhere. If you don't have access to a Bible, go get one or tell us we'll get you one. I tell you, we've got to start listening to God. We've got to stop pursuing the limited wisdom of man. This is the progressive nature of sin. First, we're, not, we're going to pretend like God doesn't exist. And since He doesn't exist, now we're going to listen to men. We're going to listen to the so-called experts. And you see this thing progressing to the next level, to the next level. Now watch. We replace God because we're not going to listen to anything that might claim there is a God. We're going to reject that. And we're going to listen to men. And so we're going to replace God with the lie of idols. Look here at verses 24 and 25. Therefore, and notice that word therefore. He's connecting it up to what he just said. That's why I'm showing the progressive nature of this. This is all connected. Therefore, because they rejected evidence for God, because they pursued the limited wisdom of man, therefore God gave them up. You know, God's not going to stop you. You want to be stubborn? Go right ahead. He won't stop you. But He will hold you responsible for your foolishness. He will hold you responsible for not listening. God gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Listen here, verse 25. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie? and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator. In that context, in that day and time, what they did was they replaced God with a lie of idol. We're going to worship this idol of stone, or this idol of wood, or this idol of metal, or this idol of marble. We're going to worship that instead of the true God. I love Isaiah, if I remember correctly. I didn't get the passage to write it down here, but I think it's Isaiah 44. Isaiah just hilariously mocks this. He says, a guy goes out and chops down a tree. He goes out in the woods and chops down a tree and he says he takes half of that tree and he forms it into a god. And he says, oh, save me, you're my god. He says he takes the other half and he cooks dinner with it. He lights that piece of wood. And it's the same piece of wood. Isaiah just mocks that as he should, as he should. Because what they've done is replace the true god with the lie of idols. And we say, well, nobody does that today, really. Think about that a minute. Hold your spot here and turn to the book of Colossians chapter 3. And look with me at verse 5. There are modern day idols, maybe not of the same nature, but certainly they do the same thing. And in Colossians 3 and verse 5, he says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. What are you talking about? Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. Here it comes, which is idolatry. You see, there's more than one kind of idol, isn't there? What do you worship? What do you worship? You worship that almighty dollar? Anything for a buck? I remember years ago, the New Heart Show, and they had Larry, Daryl, and Daryl. Hi, I'm Larry. This is my brother, Daryl. This is my other brother, Daryl. And they had a little business, anything for a buck. Is that you? It was funny on that show, but it ain't funny in real life. Anything for a buck. I'll lie, cheat, steal, whatever I got to do to make a dollar. That's a problem. You want to know what's wrong with this world? That's what's wrong with this world. People worshiping that almighty dollar. What do you worship, that bottle of alcohol? Oh, I got to have my beer. Got to have me a beer with my son. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? That's, that's no way to live. But there are people that will have that. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what the Lord says. I'm going to have my beer. I'm going to buy my lottery tickets. I'm going to have my drugs. You know, there's a big push now to legalize all this stuff. Legalize marijuana and legalize all these drugs. Oh, it's just harmless. Let people have their oblivion. Let people do what they want to do. And you're going to watch this stuff explode even worse. That temperature is going to bust that little thing over there on that world. It's going to, he's going to be in fever pitch. 
if we start legalizing all these drugs and legalizing all this sin, what do you worship? Sex? I got it. I, I, I've got, somebody told me the other day, wasn't nobody here, somebody told me the other day, said she knew a couple that divorced after 50 some years of marriage. Now think of that. They're in their 70s. Been married 50 some years. Why? Not enough sex. What? What are you talking about? You're going to throw away 50 years of marriage over that? Seriously? Seriously? And, and, and we, this becomes our God. Have to have, the, have to have booze, have to have sex, have to have drugs, have to have gambling, have to have that almighty dollar. And we get further and further and further away from God. Sometimes we get consumed, we're replacing God, remember. We get consumed with this world. Suddenly all, it's all, everything's about politics. And so we get very political. Look at some of the Facebook posts, even among brethren. Get very political. Stop it. Politics ain't the answer, folks. God is the answer. Politics ain't going to solve this world's problem. Politics just makes it worse because they play off each other. Both sides play off each other. And you get at this guy and this guy, and they may make sides up, and they didn't. This and I'm in my corner, and I'm in my corner. And all the while, the devil laughs because we're at odds with one another over politics. Seriously? But that's become our God. Climate change. Let me tell you something. Climate change is not going to do us in. How do you know that, Lanny? Because the Bible says the Lord's going to do us in. At the end of time, when Jesus returns, he'll destroy the world. The world's doomed already. And there's nothing you can do to change that. But it ain't going to be doomed by climate change. It's going to be doomed by the Lord. When he burns it all up, 2 Peter chapter 3, you might go over there and read about that. 2 Peter chapter 3, he's going to burn it all up. But no, we're going to replace God. And we've got to replace him with something. So we'll replace him with sin, or we'll replace him with politics, or we'll replace him with climate change. We'll replace him with something, but we've got to have something we serve. Got to serve something, you see. And the truth is, our real priority needs to be on God. Remember, we've already left him behind. Remember that first point? Left him behind. But it's time to go back. It's time to go back and put our priority on God. Even in the Ten Commandments, God said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Did you hear that? That's not Lanny Smith talking. That's the Bible talking to you. Stop replacing the God of the Bible with all this other junk. Because it isn't going to do a thing for you, but make the world worse. Make that temperature rise. And make the world get worse and worse and worse. Jesus said in Matthew 4 and verse 10, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So we need to be getting back to God and stop this other junk. Stop trying to replace God with other things because there's nothing better than the true and the living God. You're not going to find any one better or anything better than the true, <coughs> true and the living God. But here's another thing, Romans chapter 1. We've gotten to the point now we're normalizing the abnormal. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that? Look here at verses 24 and 25. I'm sorry, 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. He's talking about lesbianism. Likewise, the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of of their error which was due. He's talking specifically here about homosexuality. Abnormal. That is not normal. In nature, there is male and female. Why? Because it takes both to reproduce. That's nature. That's the way it works. And you start getting male with male, that's abnormal. And you know, we've got to the point now where we're bullied and shamed. How can you say that? I can say that because it's in the book. I can say that because God said it. It is abnormal. Homosexual relations is abnormal. It is not natural. They left that which was natural. Did you see that in the text? They left that which was natural. And now we're into this insanity of gender fluidity. I can pick what I, whether I want to be a woman or not. I just saw, by the way, this is where all this goes. I just saw the news the other day. A guy showed a picture of a bee. He said, look at that bee right there. He said, that bee is now a fish. He said, well, what do you mean? He, this was a legit news story. Well, in order to protect that bee, they declared it to be a fish, so it would fall under an Endangered Species Act. 
Now, that's where all this junk goes to. I can be anything. I can be a man, can be a woman. Woman can be a man. I can be a bee. I can be a puppy dog. I can be a kitty cat. I can be whatever. I, and you, you may laugh, but that's where all this stuff goes. You start allowing women to be men and men to be women, and there's no holds bar on where this goes. It goes into all sorts of insanity. Serial divorce and remarriage. When I was a boy, you hardly ever heard a divorce spoken of. And when you did hear it spoken of, people whispered about it. Psh, 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 did you hear so and so is getting a divorce? I can't hardly believe that. Now it's like, yay, I'm getting a divorce. And that's what you hear now. And they do it not just once. I've known people who've been married six and seven times. You would think somebody had been married six or seven times would go take a good, long, hard look in the mirror, wouldn't you? What's wrong with me that I can't keep a spouse? What's wrong with me? And it's always the other one, you know. Oh, there's nothing wrong with me. It's him or it's her. Well, if you're going through six and seven in a lifetime, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you. And it's time you woke up to that and realize. But we're, no, we're normalizing the abnormal. Abortion, killing babies. Let's just call it what it is. Killing babies. Oh, that's normal. We got to have that. That's our constitutional right. <laughs> Think of that. The constitutional right to commit murder. Think of that. What a joke. But our society has normalized. That's normal. Now they've done this, this little jujitsu, this me mental gymnastics. Now you're the weirdo. I'm the weirdo. Because we dare think that it ought to be one man and one woman for life. We dare think that men ought to be with women and, and, and not men with men. And not women with, we dare think, and so we're the weirdos. You see how it's flipped? You see how, what they've done, it's called gaslighting. That's psychological manipulation. You're crazy. What's the matter with you for thinking that, that men can't be with men? And they try to turn it around as though you're the bad guy and you're the nut. When in reality, we all know they're the nuts. And I don't apologize for saying that. That's insane. That's insane to think that we can normalize the abnormal. And then we're bullied into accepting it by a society that gave up on God years ago. Think of it. Now, when all this happens, and we've seen it happen in our lifetime, words that lead, that's what's wrong with the world, isn't it? We've gotten to the point, we just accept it. Whatever. Whatever floats your boat. Whatever you want to do. Romans 1, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, and he reminds them of what happened. They rejected the evidence of God. God gave them over. He's not going to stop you. Have at it. God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers. Any of that sound familiar? Any of that sound familiar? Sound like the world? Sound like the news when you turn it on? Backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Sound familiar? Sure does. It sure does. And it all started when we just decided, I don't want to believe in God anymore. That's what got it all started, you see. And these things, by the way, if you study your Bible, they go in cycles. I don't know when it's going to swing back the other way. I wish it would quick. But it probably won't be quick and it probably won't be easy. But these things do tend to go in cycles if you're familiar with your Bible history. Read on, verse 32. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but approve of them who practice them. Wide open acceptance. That's all right. You live your life and you do your thing and you go your way and I'll go mine and we'll all wind up in heaven. Don't you kid yourself. It isn't going to work that way. It isn't going to work that way. But in a world of abortion and suicide and assisted suicide, Remember Dr. Kevorkian and euthanasia? Guess what's happened? Life is devalued. Life doesn't mean anything if we can kill babies, and life doesn't mean anything if we can kill sick people, and life doesn't mean anything if we can kill old people who can't take care of themselves anymore. Life doesn't mean anything. 
And then you wonder why there are school shootings. Because life doesn't mean anything. That's why to those people, to those shooters, that's why I say the problem not the gun, the problem is the idiot behind the gun who says, I don't believe that life is valuable anymore. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm driving at here? It's the man that's holding the gun who's lost all of this and life isn't valuable anymore. In a world that puts man above God and sin is normalized, it will be pursued and pursued eagerly. What we've seen, you know, earlier I, I think I might have mentioned evolution. What we have seen is a devolution of society. That's what we've seen. It's gone downhill. It's gone the other way. It's gone far, far away from God. But I told you I was going to bring this around. I want to bring this around. I don't want to leave you on a negative here. There's good news. Let's go all the way back up here to verse 16 and 17. Look at this with me. Because you see, the reason Paul wrote all this is because he wants to tell these people about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why, Paul? For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, he talks about the gospel being the power of God unto salvation. And I understand that that salvation is ultimately in heaven. I get that. You're not going you're, you're to have a salvation here on the earth. It's ultimately in heaven. But can I suggest to you that if I win one or two, and you win one or two, and every one of us tries to win one or two for the Lord, slowly, ever so slowly, we begin to change this. One person at a time one soul at a time. We bring them to Christ and we change the dynamic of the world. And I know the ultimate salvation we're working for is up in heaven, but we can, we can, we can change things here. Remember I said these things go in cycles? We can turn the cycle around. We can stop the spread of sin. We can turn the cycle around. And what I'm trying to get you to see is this should be motive, motive for you, this should be impetus for you to get more involved in evangelism. Yes, you. You say, well, we hired an evangelist. Yeah, but I can't teach everybody. You see? And, and the next guy who comes can't teach everybody. But if I teach who I can teach and you teach who you can teach. And think of that for just a minute. Just think of that simple policy. Each one win one. Each one win one. If that were held true, let's all win one person to Christ this year. Do you realize that in a year the church would double in size? Have you thought about that? You thought about the impact of that? And, and if each one wins two, the church triples in size. Think of that. The, the power of numbers, the power of multiplying this. And so we can stop the bleed. We can stop the trend. But it's up to us. If we don't do it, who will? If we don't get out there and teach the lost, who's going to do this? It's up to us. God put it in our hands. Go, he said, into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. I encourage you, don't let this get you down. Let this motivate you to get up and go teach, to get up and go talk to your neighbor, to your friend, to your family member, to your co-worker, and try to win somebody for Christ. And once you win that one, move on to the next one. Don't stop. When I say each one win one, I don't mean win one and stop. I mean, once you're done winning that one, move on to the next one. But this is what it's going to take. You want to stop the bleed. You want to stop what's wrong with the world. It's going to take you and I getting out there with the gospel. Take out your songbooks now and turn to the song of invitation. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, we encourage you to seriously consider changing the direction of your life today. Think of it. You can do it today. This very day, you walked in here a sinner, you can walk out of here a saved person. You can walk out of here a Christian. And then you can take that information and you can tell it to somebody else and make somebody else a Christian. We can change the world today, one soul at a time. If you're not a Christian, believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died for your sins, that He rose from the grave, and that He reigns at God's right hand. Believe that. Repent of your sins. Confess that faith and be baptized. Right behind me is the baptistry, warm, clean, ready to go. The only thing missing is you. If you're subject to that call, won't you come while we stand and sing?